happy Sunday to you. Our next speaker, Louise Treadwell. Louise is an eternal web developer, web development geek, and social media junkie. She's a native of Metro Detroit and an alumni of the University of Michigan. Go blue. She learned about the human side of computer science while earning her master's degree in library and information science, fancy, and has fine-tuned her web developer skills over the course of 20 plus years of career building, breaking and fixing sites for multiple uh, startups. She's never had a quote unquote real job or worked in a real office and thus is quite well versed on the realities of being a successful freelancer, remote contractor, and small business owner. Louise loves coffee, is full of useless facts, and is eagerly waiting for her shot on Jeopardy. She lives in South Florida with her three bouncing boys and her husband. She's here to talk to us today about working with diverse teams. Miami, let's welcome Louise Treadwell. Thank you. All right, as he said, I'm Louise Treadwell. I'm gonna be talking about diverse teams. Uh, we're gonna discuss how biases can be a barrier to building up diverse teams. And then we're gonna talk about how inclusion can directly add value to your company. So we're gonna start off with, which this works. Yes, we're in business. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a simple definition of a diverse team. Um, a team that's made up of people from a wide range of backgrounds, experiences, levels of, of ability, and cultural perspectives. So when most people are asked if they support the idea of um, promoting diversity in the workplace, they're going to say, yes, of course, definitely, why not? If you step a little bit further and ask them, um, how do you deal with your own personal biases when you're putting together these teams, when you're going through the interview process? That's when I usually get what I'm going to call the speech. And the speech usually goes a little bit like this. Um, I'm not biased at all. Uh, the only race is the human race. I don't see color because I am colorblind. Now, as somebody who actually is colorblind, I am, this casual use of the phrase, I am colorblind, doesn't bother me or offend me so much as it just kind of irritates me. First of all, even if you are colorblind, you're still gonna be able to see something as obvious as somebody's race. Duh, right? Uh, secondly, it's not really polite or a good thing to completely try and eliminate um, an entire aspect of someone's persona or their cultural identity. That's not, it's not a compliment to do that. Uh, if you guys don't walk away with, and if you guys don't walk away from this talk, have taken anything at all from what I'm saying, I want you guys to embrace and understand this. There is nothing wrong with seeing race. There's nothing wrong with seeing disability. There's nothing wrong with seeing cultural identity. These are all perfectly fine things to observe. It just means that you're a person who's capable of making observations about the world around you. It only becomes a problem when you try and attach that physical observation to a value judgment. Um, so we're gonna give you an example of that. I was talking to a mom who said that she was worried that her four-year-old was exhibiting racist tendencies, okay? I mean, the kid's four, it's possible, but. So her example that she gave me was she said she told her daughter, we're gonna have a new therapist coming to the house soon. And her daughter said, okay, mommy, is the therapist going to have light skin or dark skin? And the mom completely kind of came unglued and freaked out. And she's like, well, honey, I don't know, but whether he has light skin or dark skin, I'm sure he's gonna be a really good person and really good at his job. Now, let's unpack what just happened here. The kid made a simple observation, a physical observation. The mom took that observation and attached it to a value judgment. Imagine if instead the kid had asked her about the uh, color of a car and the mom had said, well, honey, I don't know if his car is gonna be blue or green, but..." I'm sure he's gonna be a really good person. He's gonna be really good at his job. That's ridiculous. There's absolutely no reason to attach the color of somebody's car to the goodness or badness of a person. So why did the mom do that when she was talking about, you know, a person? Um, sorry, lost my place here a little bit. Uh, obviously the mother's intent was not to do that. She was trying to do the exact opposite. She was trying to convince her child of something that Maybe deep down inside herself, she didn't really believe to be true. And kids can pick up when we do things like that. Like um, if I tell my son, oh, asparagus is yummy, it's great. He's going to look at me and say, you're selling this way too hard, lady. Like there's no way. 
So, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so back to the story. What the mom did was um, automatically assume her daughter, why did she assume that this question about skin color was a bad thing? Why, what, what inside of her led her to that? And that is something that is implicit bias. Um, every single one of us harbors implicit biases about any multitude of things. And I really do mean everybody, everyone. If you're judging someone by their accent or their demeanor or the way they dress or their educational background, we're making value judgments in the back of our mind without even realizing that we're doing it. Um, so the problem with this is that, well, you can look at the definition and see it. Within implicit biases, it's an unconscious thing. So it's been with these things, these feelings, these ideas have been with us so long that we don't even remember where they came from. We don't even remember where we got them. In the example I gave, the daughter kind of accidentally inherited these biases from her mom. As she goes through life, she's gonna kind of remember that time her mom freaked out about skin color and talked about somebody being good and bad and that might actually morph into something, you know, different later as she goes along. So if you're not aware of your own biases, then how can you be absolutely sure that you're not injecting those biases into the interviewing process? When you're looking for new people, you're trying to build new teams. So here's an example. Let's say your company wants to hire a new copywriter. And someone on your team says, you know what, we should make a social media post about it. And you say, that's a great idea. We can, you know, job search within our own network. Your graphic designer puts together this really cool meme. That's how you say it, meme, mem. Meme, okay. They put together a really cool meme. It has a witty description of the job, tells people where to go to apply, and then the social media manager puts it up on the website and LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. And the caption says, um, our family is expanding. Please share this with anyone you think you know would be a great fit. So you get a bunch of resumes, you do a bunch of interviews, you hire somebody. This is a good thing, right? This was a successful venture. There's one huge problem here. You completely left out and eliminated an entire segment of the professional copywriting industry. How? Because all of the important information about your job posting was hidden inside of an image that's completely invisible to screen readers. So this is a, this problem, like it happens a lot. Like honestly, if you go on social media, it's very, very rare that you're gonna see people actually write out what's in an image and when it's like a jokey, jokey meme, you know, who cares? But when it's a job posting, you're actually eliminating somebody's opportunity to apply for a particular position. And it's silly because there's absolutely nothing about being a copywriter that requires you to be able to see. Um, we've got screen reading technologies. There's all kinds of accessible technologies out there that make it very easy for these people to participate in these, you know, professions. Um, and actually, that's, it's not even just uh, in the realm of copywriting. It's really, there's, there's a lot of jobs out there that you don't have to be able to use your eyes to do. But our, like, as a, in general, as a society, we're so biased against people with disabilities that we kind of don't even consider their employability or their talent level, so we don't even think to include them. And it might not be malicious. Honestly, it usually isn't malicious. Uh, it's just a complete oversight. And it's something that we have to be aware of and try and combat. So an implicit bias can actually be a direct barrier to building a diverse team. So how do we fix this and do we care? <laughs> Let's see where we're at here. Okay. So as far as how we're going to fix this or what we'll think about first, do we care? I want you guys to think from a strictly capitalistic, selfish point of view. Don't think about it as like an altruistic thing. Think about it as... In order for my business to succeed, I need to be able to hire the best people at you know, whatever the price point is that I can afford. If you're not fishing from the full pond, then you have no way of knowing if you're actually getting the best people. Um, but your competitors probably are. So while you're gonna end up with a mediocre person, they're gonna end up with this you know, top, very, very talented copywriter who may or may not use a screen reader. We don't know, but you haven't actually gone out and talked to everyone. Um, okay, so as far as actually being inclusive, this is a lightning talk, so we can't get you know too deep into the reads on this, but we can look at this quick list here 
make sure everything is showing. Applicant down to work environment, yeah. When you're going through and you're thinking about hiring new people at your business, or you're thinking about onboarding a new technology, I want you to go through and ask yourself a bunch of questions about who you might be eliminating, who you might be offending, who you might be alienating by you know, whichever thing you're picking. So for example, in a job description, I saw a job description once for an office job, and they were requiring that people had a driver's license and their own vehicle. Now, their excuse was they were trying to eliminate unreliable people, but they also completely eliminated anyone who relies on public transit for a million different reasons. Um, there's a lot of reasons why somebody might not be able to drive that has nothing to do with their accountability, reliability, any of that. Um, interview setting. If you're not open to the idea of flex work, remote work, um, what are some other scenarios? Teleworking. There are a lot of people who actually need those type, sort of accommodations to do their job better. If someone has PTSD, sitting in an office environment for 40 hours a week may or may not be something that they can handle at that exact moment. It has nothing to do with their talent level. Their productivity could be great, but you're going to miss out on them because you have this like ridiculous notion that someone has to have their butt in a chair for 40 hours every week. So that person is going to end up being a remote worker working for your competitor, and you'll never even know the difference. You're overpaying for a mediocre talent, and you think that you know everything's fine. I'll try to give you guys one more example. Applicant requirements. I've actually seen this one a lot, that people will require a degree when it's not really necessary, because they think that, they think that they're going to get someone better than what they can afford or what the position requires. Um, you'll see a lot of veterans actually getting discriminated against in this arena. So you'll have like 10 years experience in whatever your field is, plus like security clearance, um, all kinds of certifications. You just happen to have not had time to finish a degree because you were being shot at somewhere in Iraq. So why do you not having a bachelor's or a master's degree have anything to do with how you're going to perform on this particular job? And big, big, big companies are working very hard to have inclusion and diversity efforts within themselves. So like HP or Microsoft, they'll actually have entire departments dedicated to diversity and inclusion. And they're going to be winning these people and getting all these you know, new workers and new staffers. And they're having you know, innovative interviewing processes. If there's someone who, um, maybe due to autism, doesn't interview very well. I'm one of those people. Like I kind of shake when I talk. <laughs> So if I was sitting in an interview, it would be kind of silly if you're judging me based on that when I'm a web developer. It doesn't matter how awkward I am because it's just me and the computer. It's very rare that I'm going to interact with you know, the actual clients. Uh, the same thing goes for a graphic designer. Why are you judging them on their ability to write a really great cover letter? That's really, really stupid. Their job isn't to write cover letters. Their job is to do graphic design. Stop making people fill out these long forms and just rethink everything about the way that you are handling your whole intake process. And you'll probably be very, very surprised at the difference in applicants that you get. You'll be surprised at the new types of people that you meet. Um, you might be surprised at what some hidden disabilities your existing employees might be able to admit to because you've changed certain things within your company. You've taken certain software, made it standard instead of just an option. And It'll just open up a whole new world for your business. And that is that. Thank you. Do we have time for any questions? I don't think we. One or two? If anybody does have a question. About any resources? Oh, yeah. Um, about, he's asking about when someone's trying to get hired but they don't have the right qualifications. So, oh, right, right, right. Um, well, as a business owner, that's something I, well, he's asking if you have all the qualifications but you don't have the degree. As a business owner, when you're writing the job descriptions, that's something that you need to address and really ask yourself. Every time you list something, say, is this really important? Does this matter? As a job seeker, there's not really much you can do except to go apply for the company who is going to appreciate you. But 
at that job description writing phase, that's when you really need to dig in and do the serious work and pick through everything. Everything that you think is like standard and routine and this is just how it's always done, this is what we require. Ask yourself, what would happen if I just scratched this off? Who would end up applying as a result? So there, oh, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Citrix she said that what window. would you do if you Close saw a job button. description that had something illegal in it, something that says we're looking for someone who's young and fresh out of college. Obviously, that's age discrimination Citrix right off the bat. Window. You can't really use the word young in a job description like that. Um, there are government departments, such as like the, the, is this the e King. no. Furion. Yeah, I really just turn them in. <laughs> Because it's not worth fighting with someone Andrew. because honestly, they've just proven you don't want to work with them. And that's the danger Desktop. of Word putting Camp these Miami things out there. Celebrating See, 10 look, years. it's a screen reader. <laughs> Guide for no, it's Sunday, fine. March 18th. Word command yeah, it's, not it, available. The accessibility settings are on somewhere, which is exactly what we're talking about. So that's perfectly fine. Narrator funny. settings window. Exiting narrator. But yeah, if a company proves that there's someone you don't want to work for, it's not worth pushing back at them and trying to battle them. You should just move on and let it go. Uh, report them, obviously. Maybe send in a complaint to their HR department. But Schedule WordCamp Miami there. 2018 <laughs> so window. I saw, yeah. Schedule WordCamp Miami 2018. Desktop, schedule WordCamp Miami 2, social media, best practices, WordCamp Miami social, displaying WordCamp Miami social media, Dr. Nancy Richmond. PPTX. Uh, unknown key. Unknown key. Cortana window. So you're box. saying when someone's at a Selected. the contract, the, the company that hired window. the contractor Search is box. editing, e ease of access center, link, speech right, control panel home, link, and speech properties dialog, OK button, speech properties right. dialog. Right, so he's talking about people language, being discriminated against because they are profiles, a contractor or a freelancer. One columns, <laughs> one column headers, volume control. Is it still? Okay, I'll just answer your last question. He was just saying about when a corporation discriminates against contractors because they would prefer to hire someone um, through the HR venue and like, you know, a full-time person. That's their mistake and their loss because it's everybody knows that if you try and hire a contractor for an individual project, you're actually going to get a lot more labor out of them than you are somebody who's sitting in a chair for 40 hours. People, what was that line in office space? He's like, I only really do any real work from about 3 to 5 o'clock every day. So again, if that's what an employer is doing and that's what the client wants, I mean, just walk away from them and go find somebody who is going to appreciate you. Yeah. Every time. Okay, I am definitely out of time. Um, if you guys want to visit my site, uh, it's louisetreadwell.com, or you can, um, I'll have my speaker notes on there to download. And uh, thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you.